That's our crew patch, which parenthetically, with uh, some inputs from us, was designed by my uncle, who's an artist in uh, Annapolis, Maryland. You've all seen launches before. Uh, they're always spectacular to us that ride on them. Uh, and I know from watching some of them, they're spectacular from the ground also. You're aware that we uh, had a scrub the first day due to uh, upper level wind shears. And uh, even though it was a beautiful blue sky on that day, it was the right thing to do to uh, cancel for the day. And we went back to the quarters and relaxed and got up the next morning and 7.15 Eastern time, here we, uh, here we go. This is the second flight of Discovery. Uh, always a beautiful sight as it goes through its roll program to point us down range. And uh, certainly a thrilling uh, feeling. I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dave Walker and let him give you some of his impressions of his first flight. Well, I was excited, obviously. <laughs> they, uh, they don't measure our heart rates anymore going uphill, but I'm sure mine was really thumping. On the other hand, the vehicle flew absolutely smoothly and exactly as we had been prepared uh, to expect it to. And the whole thing felt very controlled, although uh, there's a tremendous rush involved with, with this particular experience, as you might imagine. Anna Fisher was our flight engineer sitting in between uh, Dave and myself and being prepared to prompt us to make sure we did all the right things, which she did beautifully. Joe? Uh, eight and a half minutes later, we were in orbit. I asked if I could open my eyes yet. And uh, this is what one sees uh, when you do open your eyes. It's a beautiful, beautiful sight. Uh, the crew members, Rick, uh, looking somewhat uh, relieved that the launch went so well. Uh, trusty pilot, Dave Walker. Unidentified mission specialist, uh, Anna Fisher. And straight from the college campus, <laughs> Dale, <laughs> Dale Gardner. Uh, we are. That is just a, a quick scenes of life in orbit. Our first task, of course, was to to deploy Telsat. Uh, it was a nighttime deploy, and so this is a TV picture, nighttime TV picture of the deploy. It looks uh, uh, more or less like uh, in the day. You just can't uh, see it too well. Uh, went smoothly and. Uh, Really not much else to say about that. We had another deploy the next day, and Dale, why don't you uh, describe that? Flight day three, uh, we deployed the CINCOM satellite called LeSat sometimes, similar to what you saw this last spring on 41D. It's a large satellite, as you can see. comes out in that Frisbee fashion that we've talked about before. It's uh, about 14 feet in diameter and uh, weighs 13,000 pounds. And uh, it really looked uh, large to us as it came out of the payload bay. Very slowly also, as you can see, only uh, just a little over a foot per second uh, departure from the bay. The one nice aspect about the CINCOM deploy is that we, uh, we punch it out down towards the earth in the, in the attitude we're at. So as it uh, leaves the bay, and you can see here, we have a beautiful view of the earth down below uh, as the satellite uh, departs. This is a... A, a few scenes of some of the things we do on orbit that, that don't generally get shown. This is a fairly mundane uh, operation, but very important one, uh, called the on-orbit flight control system checkout, which Rick and I did. Gives you a chance to see what the flight deck looks like a little bit on orbit, rather, rather like a large airliner. The CRTs uh, there can be seen blinking. And from there, we're, we're going to show you a little bit of the mid-deck. This actually was taken by Dr. Allen with uh, Captain Houck pushing him along as, as, he, as he held our movie camera in front of him, going down into the mid-deck. And you can see the portable foot restraints uh, that we attach to enable us to stay put, our treadmill that, that we use for exercise, and some of the lockers. Uh, that particular one that's open contains in-flight maintenance equipment, which uh, Eagle Electronics used. And over uh, on the starboard, bulkhead of the mid-deck, you can see the sleep uh, accommodations, which uh, I think I'll let Dr. Fisher discuss a little bit about the, the rest of the mid-deck area. Well, in this uh, particular sequence, we're showing how we prepare a meal. And uh, we divided these tasks up uh, among all the crew members. Uh, Dale usually wound up doing breakfast because nobody was quick enough for him. Uh, <laughs> making um, 
meals was a fairly uh, easy task on orbit. All you had to do is essentially like, <laughs> it's very good, uh, essentially like backpacking, you essentially add water to, to the food, and um, it was very good. I'll let uh, Rick describe what we're doing here. Well, at the risk of endorsing a product, that's an interesting uh, physical uh, demonstration on orbit of the fact that uh, things really are weightless. And that's how the crew was rewarded when we did something uh, properly. <laughs> Rick would release another handful. <laughs> Since Anna did more things right than anybody, she got most of <laughs> You can see it is a rather dreamlike world. Uh, <laughs> Uh, both uh, awake and sleeping. This is uh, uh, Dave in the upper bunk after the first EVA. Saying, oh no, we have to do another one? Yeah. <laughs> Part of our uh, time on orbit is spent uh, doing filter cleaning. What you see uh, Dale and Dave doing here is removing some panels so that we can get to access to the filters. Uh, again, it's much like life here on Earth. You got to things you got to do. You got to eat. You got to be able to clean uh, all of your equipment. This actually took uh, several hours. We were doing this on the day in between EVAs. Um, then once those panels were removed, we were able to get access to the filters, and uh, <laughs> here I am cleaning again. I thought I was going to escape that for a couple of weeks, but uh, for a week or so, but uh, and this is, as I said, a very important part of our, our uh, work on orbit to keep things clean. You can see it wasn't just me who did that uh, up on the flight deck. Uh, Dave's a clean ship is a happy ship. Dave uh, on orbit described uh, Dr. Rowan as a uh as large in personality but uh, diminutive in stature. Whenever his personality got a little bit too large, we would uh, stuff him away in a locker for a few hours. And uh, then when a task needed to be done, it was my job to go out, go down and get him out. This was a somewhat unpleasant task for me, but uh, but Joe Joe seemed to like the freedom at times. And <laughs> the hard part was putting him back in there again later once we got him. Back. <laughs> Flight days five and seven, of course, are the EVA days. This is the airlock. You can see the two suits up by my left and right shoulder. The main suits uh, down by my right leg is a spare suit that we carried. Uh, when it was determined the two prime suits were uh, going to operate properly, uh, we took that uh, spare suit out and uh, didn't use it. Up on the flight deck, the folks were preparing uh, for the rendezvous. Yeah, the day uh, started fairly early for Rick and myself, about an hour and a half into our post-sleep uh, activities. We got in involved in the sequence of burns that were going to require to bring us in proximity uh, with, the, with the satellite. Uh, as you can see here, we were always checking and double-checking each other, making sure that every input we put in was correct. This is a sequence through the um, COAS, our device for, uh, that Rick used to um, look overhead to sight on the satellite. And this, as you can see, you can see the satellite at uh, a distance of about, uh, I guess we were 50 miles here. It looked like a, uh, a star uh, as you looked up. And I'll hand it over to, to Rick now to talk about the final parts of the rendezvous. Here we are probably about uh, 300 feet now, maybe down to about uh, 50 feet away from the satellite. We're firing lots of jets on board to slow us down, to rendezvous with the satellite, putting it just about 35 feet from satellite to overhead the bay. Uh, after uh, the next sunrise, uh, here's Joe getting ready to go out with the MMU. We have a sequence of, uh, of uh, footage now that are drawn from both the, the EVAs, uh, interspersed, we won't distinguish between the two, but give, try to give you a flavor for what it was like. Uh, Rick says, right at sunrise, we went out uh, Dale's actually flying out here with uh, Rick recording most of this on all sorts of uh, film. Uh, about this time I thought uh, uh, that he should think twice about it, but Dale, <laughs> go ahead and uh, describe. The, uh, Joe had done this on uh, flight day five and uh, had proven that the MMU and the Stinger concept for capturing the satellite uh, worked, in fact worked perfectly. And, uh, and I essentially had just a lot of fun on flight day seven, knowing that, uh, knowing that it all worked. There was, it took a big load off my mind. 
You can, I flew out a little bit differently than uh, Joe had. Uh, you might remember Joe commenting that the sun had bothered him. It was in his eyes during the last phase. And uh, you'll see here in a minute that uh, when the sun finally does come up, I was fortunate enough to use the orbiter's nose to, uh, to shadow the sun. So my approach to the satellite, uh, and you can see that the shadow of the nose of the orbiter now is on the satellite and on, and on me. And um, so my docking was, uh, was a little bit easier with that information that uh, Joe had given me from uh, the earlier EVA. MMUs uh, uh, perform flawlessly, as, as you heard us uh, talk about uh, from space. And uh, this, this method of capturing the satellite uh, certainly worked well. In the, uh, you can see the arm in the lower right corner of the picture, which was a position that Anna had put it in to assist in our station keeping task. Notice that the people who brought that satellite to us uh, left it in absolutely perfect uh, position with regard to its rotation and lack of nutation, which we appreciated. We can't emphasize that enough. The satellite originally was rotating uh, 50 revolutions per minute, but was slowed down by ground controllers very painstakingly over many, many weeks' time. Uh, positioned and slowed down. And in the slowing, it, they left it uh, still turning at a very, very regular uh, rate. So it made our job uh, absolutely easy as pie. Uh, once docked, the procedure then was to use the MMU to stop the rotation, which uh, was equally easy. Uh, you can see it's now quite stable. And the MMU pilot could then maneuver the satellite, turn it uh, wherever we wanted it, in such a way that Anna could, could uh, grab the grapple fixture. Yeah, this is a sequence from the uh, first uh, rendezvous, and uh, it worked just like it did in the simulator, getting uh, Joe commands to maneuver it such that I could uh, see the end effector, uh, the grapple target, and it went very well, very smoothly. From an from a MMU crewman's point of view, it's interesting to see the large arm coming up uh, right over your shoulder to suddenly grasp the satellite. Uh, this is uh, a shot of Dale working uh, on the satellite, the uh, top end. In fact, he just removed the, the Omni antenna with uh, some very fancy space equipment uh, known as pruning shears. That was about the last nominal portion of that first EVA. Here we, here we see where we first learned uh, as a group that the common bracket clamp, which Dale has in his hand, was not going to fit at the appropriate place, which was on the common bracket on the satellite. Let's parenthetically uh, emphasize that that was a very well-designed piece of equipment by folks here at JSC, and unfortunately, we just didn't have the information available to us that would tell us that it would not fit. And it's appropriate to add here that we had enough pre-planned contingency operations available to us that, that again had been developed uh, not, not by us but by the whole team to, uh, to carry us through and we went to, to plan B as we called it at that point. David was the keeper of plan B. Uh, Dale and I had not the vaguest notion what it was but we were confident that in his plans Dave could direct us and uh, the first step he uh, directed me to, uh, to uh, come off the stinger, uh, fly the MMU back to its uh, storage place uh, in the orbiter and uh, then uh, prepare to hold the satellite uh, at the antenna end while Dale worked on it. You get a, a, an idea of the flying qualities of the MMU here. It uh, is as smooth as glass to fly. You just uh, can put it wherever you want it, turn it as you want it. Uh, interesting, you see here the reflection in my helmet of the the bulkhead, you see the two windows through which uh, the three uh, other crewmen were working, or behind which they were working. And in fact, here at the last, you can even see the movie camera that Rick has uh, pointed out the window taking this movie. Uh, the bright spot on the bulkhead is the light that we use to illuminate the work uh, volume out in the payload bay during the nighttime passes. About this point, we said, uh, well, you can see Dale working in the back, by the way. That's a good shot of him showing the teamwork involved, getting that uh, foot restraint ready with some tool boards and so on uh, so that we can press on to the next task. Meanwhile, Joe is getting ready to, to 
doff the manned uh, maneuvering unit and go to put himself in the portable foot restraint, which is forward of where you could see there. And here he is now, uh, and he's supposed to talk here, but I'm going to say first that this was, this was uh, not easy for Joseph. He worked very hard for a long time here, and, and both of the EVA crewmen worked, worked very hard during this particular phase of it. We were all very, very concerned that this part went well, and, and fortunately it, it did. You can see, though, that uh, the satellite, although it weighs about 1,200 pounds, is, uh, is only massive in orbit. It's not heavy, and you can move it uh, to wherever it needs to be moved. The, the diff most difficult part was you could not tell really where you were putting it. And so we relied totally on directions from uh, Dave most of the time and occasionally as to where it should be moved. And they would just say, uh, over your head or more to the right. And we tried to be very careful that uh, we were not moving it to a place where it would hit the side of the orbiter or a piece of equipment on the orbiter, lest it be damaged. Joe's bringing the satellite back down into position for me to put the, sh the shower cap, as we called it. It was a, a cover that we put over the nozzle such that uh, small particles of, uh, that were inside the rocket engine would not contaminate the payload bay. Here I've uh, attached the adapter, that interface that will allow the satellite to go into the payload bay, onto the satellite, and I'm torquing down one of the nine hard dock latches that we had to, uh, had to use in order to form a tight fit between the satellite and that adapter. Now Joe has handed the satellite and adapter combination to me. I'm holding it, and uh, he's going to go around to get in position for us to uh, berth the uh, combination into the bay. <laughs> and it worked. It worked. Uh, there uh, shows a, a photo of the two satellites and uh, a little uh, advertisement there. We had to uh, several times after uh, after flight day seven, when both were in the bay, go up to the windows and just look back there to make sure both satellites were there. There were times when, when none of the five of us really believed that we'd actually uh, actually pulled it off, and it was certainly comforting to look back there and see both those satellites staring at us. Well, in the words of an old philosopher, it ain't over till it's over, and I guarantee it's not over yet because we still have to land. And uh, here we are at uh, runway one five at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, good calls from the folks uh, in the air and on the ground. John Young, weather pilot. The weather was good to the north, uh, so we landed with a slight tailwind. <coughs> and uh, coming down here at uh, 300 feet, Dave deployed the landing gear. And the orbiter flew beautifully just as we uh, trained for it to fly in the uh, shuttle training airplane. Look at the uh, vortexes being shed off the wingtips there. And when we touch down, you can see how the uh, smoke from the tires gets caught up in those vortices. Real pretty picture. Touchdown was at about 190 knots. Uh, I understand about 2,700 feet down the runway. And uh, we used a total of 93 to 9,500 feet of runway during the rollout. It was very nice for us to come back to the Kennedy Space Center. All of our families were there. Of course, it's nice for the program that we got back there also to reduce turnaround time.